Welcome to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. You can send questions for each show on Twitter using the hashtag Indie Beacon. Now sit back and enjoy learning about our guest for this show. This is Charlotte Canyon, author of the book, You Have to Laugh to Keep from Crying, How to Parent Your Parents. And we are here today, and we're going to speak with, and it's Drenda Williams. And she's the author of the book, The Will to Live, Finding the Strength to Survive. Drenda, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Well, good. I, I looked at that title and I'm going, wow, that could be a heavy, heavy topic. Can you tell us a little bit about um, why you started writing and when you started writing? Okay. Um, I started writing this particular book in 2010. Um, The book is about domestic violence and the situation I was in um, beginning at 17 and lasting into my early 20s. Um, and so it took a period of six years to, to finish the book just because I have um, some other professional things going on. Um, but I made it a point the last year or so to, to get it finished because I know the impact it can be on individuals' lives who are going through those particular situations. Did you experience this personally in your family? Yeah, so the book actually recounts those events those that I went through, and there's a series of them, um, and they're very vivid when you read the book um, about the things I went through my high school years. Some of those things involve being drugged down the street, um, chased in a car. Um, so the beginning of the book talks about those experiences, um, being a victim of domestic violence, and it later transitions into providing um, tips on what to do if you're in that particular situation. And then it transitions again to the healing process and becoming a survivor from those traumatic um, things that occurred um, in my particular life. Yeah. Do you think that everybody can survive going through what you went through or in different situations, I'm sure there's, you know, all kinds of different situations, but do you think there's people that carry that baggage with them their whole lives? Um, yes, I, I, I do believe that some individuals never heal from, from that situation. Um, a lot of times individuals that have been in the, a domestic violence situation, if they're um, able to leave, the next relationship they get into is similar to that one because they didn't take that proper time to heal, to to know what not to do um, in their new relationship. Um, and then, as you know, that from statistics, some individuals never make it out because they are um, murdered um, by their abuser um, or injured to the point where it's a fatality. Or traumatized, maybe emotionally. Yes, and, and traumatized emotionally, because a lot of times we think about physical abuse, but there's also emotional and mental abuse that occurs that may not be physical. Yeah. Do you now? I noticed in yours, you you kind of talked a little bit about dating violence, and there was a stat there. You said that college females. What percentage was that of college females that you think experiences, or that you've you've read or proven that or experienced, you know, uh, dating violence? Don't have um, the statistics right in front of me, but I think it it was either twenty five or thirty two percent. Um, of those individuals experience some type of dating violence. Um, And and a lot of times you don't realize that the statistic is that high, Um, but I do have um, daughters and I know, you know, just in conversations, there is that occurring even now um, where they go to school where, you know, sometimes females think it's normal behavior for, you know, a young man um, or vice versa, a young man thinks it's normal behavior for a female to have those controlling tendencies um, that can later lead to abuse. Mm, that is scary, isn't it? Do you think that, um, that, you know, you talked about the abuse with dating, and do you think it occurs younger 
And if so, uh, did you address any of that in your book? Um, I I experienced it in high school, so that's what I um, talk about in my in my okay. book. And, and my particular situation stems from having low self esteem um, because I did grow up poor. Um, you know, sometimes no food, sometimes no running water. Um, and at that critical, you know, high school is a difficult as it is, um, Mm -hmm. you know, just the dynamic of that. And in addition, you know, being picked on um, to make yourself seem so low where, you know, a person might find interest in you and that kind of helps you build yourself up a little bit. But it could be a toxic situation where it's not not healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be the wrong wrong person. Well, I have a granddaughter um, who is – basically lost right now and she was molested as a child Mm -hmm. and at 13 she got really involved with some bad bad things and right now she I mean she probably had one of the highest IQs and I think I mentioned earlier I have 20 grandchildren she -hmm. had one of the highest IQs and highest potential but due to what had happened to her as a child she she's been down in this this pit for so long that she's Content there. We're not content with her being there, but you know, right. she, she she has no self esteem. Like you say, they can steal away the person you are. They can steal away mm-hmm. your self esteem. They steal away your very existence. Um, mm-hmm. But um, you know, it's it's kind of sad when things happen. But it doesn't, and the statistic that I know is it happens in one in three families, and that's just scary as can be. Yeah, and a lot of people that may have not been in a domestic violence situation, they know someone. Like you're saying, it could be a family member um, that's going through it. And so um, part of my thought process in writing the book is to also kind of explain it so those individuals who haven't been through it can kind of understand what the person in that situation is thinking. Uh, Because a lot of times people say, well, why don't they just leave, go, you know, if they're abusing you, just leave. But in that particular situation, it's not that easy for whatever reason. It could be your self-esteem. It could be you're afraid, you know, of the particular person or the person's going to say they're going to kill you if you leave or do something to your family members. So in that situation, it's sometimes not as easy as people think for various reasons. Yeah, and you and you, could you give it? You said that you had a, gave a lot of tips in your book of how to avoid it or how to to recognize it or what. Are, can you give us some of those signs that you know? Yeah, some of maybe some of our young listeners. Uh, when I say young, in their twenties, that's young mm-hmm. to me. <laughs> you know that that maybe they could see in a, in a in a date mm-hmm. situation or even um, someone could act up in a classroom or um, at a at a job. Mhm. Yeah, um one of the easiest um I would say signs um that I think that is recognizable is the controlling aspect. If they don't want you to, you know, be around your friends or have that me time alone away from them, you know, for whatever reason, that is like a major sign. Um you should be allowed to, you know, go places without asking permission or um, them contacting you every, you know, few minutes saying, where are you at? You know, who are you with? What's that? Who are you talking to? So that's one of the major signs. Um, Another one is like demeaning behavior, maybe calling you a curse word or or being very derogatory to kind of tear you down. That's not normal behavior for someone. If you're in a particular relationship and, and they care about you to, you know, tear you down instead of build you up. Um, So, that's one of the things that at the, the high school um, level that's recognizable. Um, another thing I would say would be like temper, like a short temper where, you know, maybe something small agitates them for them to be angry. I mean, we, we all might um, be irritated at particular things, but it's not that rage, you know, that occurs um, that could lead to um, possible abuse. Yeah, so those and you are said a few some. Of the tips. Yeah, and and you said some of the abuse can be physical, but some can also be emotional. How would they, you know, recognize the emotional games that some to, of them play? Yeah, um, a lot of times 
the emotional aspect is to get you to think that you're, you know, you're deserving of that negative abuse or behavior that they're um, exhibiting with you. Um, it, it, if they're calling you stupid, you know, dumb, you know, not worth anything, trying to tear you down. And like you said, at, sometimes the emotional effect lingers on well past, you know, the physical abuse. You know, if you um, are beaten or something like that, your body heals, but emotionally that sits in your head and you, and you start to question, well, am I like that? You know, is it my fault? What did I do? Why, wh- what did I do to cause him to treat me like this? And that's the whole um, control part is to get you to you be so low that you think you need them. And, and that also plays a part into why you don't leave. You know, you think, oh, well, I did something, or they're going to change. They love me. Um, but that, that type of behavior definitely isn't love. Yeah, and, but they do tell you they love you. Oh, yeah. Oh, they, they'll tell you they love you, and, oh, they're sorry. Um, and unless there's a huge rehabilitation, it's always going to occur again. In my particular situation, I, I believe they were going to stop, but it never stopped. It only got worse. Yeah. Did you, I mean, in your situation, did you let it get to the max before you bailed out or did someone help you out? Um, yeah. And I talk, I talk about this in the book. The situation that was a turning point for me is when I was taken out again, I, I was, I lived in a rural community, so I was taken out on a blacktop road and held at gunpoint and raped that I made the decision. I was going to die. I was going to so, die if I stayed. So I wanted to die, you know, trying to get away from them. Okay. And so that's when I started taking active steps. Yeah. Well, we're we're speaking with Drenda Williams, and her book is The Will to Live: Finding the Strength to Survive. Stay tuned after this after this break, and we'll hear more about how she survived. A new online bookstore, IndieLector.store, is unlike any other. IndieLector.store offers great prices from top indie authors and supports authors at the same time by paying them more for their books. IndieLector.store has a readers club that gives you free books and special deals. Watch the IndieLector.store continue to grow before it opens in the fall of 2019 at IndieLector.store. Howdy, I'm John Cruder, the Midnight Marauder. I guess you might say that I'm a vigilante who writes the wrongs I see along my many travels to balance the scales of justice, especially those of the corrupt and murderous members of the town council of Bandera, Texas. You can follow my many adventures in a series of Midnight Marauder books written by Roy Clinton on Amazon.com and TopWesterns.com. Or, if you prefer... Listen to my adventures in audiobook form by downloading them from audible.com or iTunes. This is R. William James, the voice of the Midnight Marauder. Do you love to read great new ebooks? Visit ebg247.com. Be the first to discover the next bestseller. At EBG247, we have the web's largest selection of great new book reads, from that amazing new fiction or nonfiction to horror, romance, and fantasy. We even have today's best children's books. That's ebg247.com. New books arrive daily, and all ebooks start at just 99 cents. If you love to read, then you'll love EBG247. Dot com. Low prices, large selection, and an easy-to-use website. It's all only at ebg247.com. Texas Authors is proud to be a supporter of IndieBeacon.com, a website that supports indie authors from around the world. If you are looking for help with marketing or getting published, IndieBeacon.com can assist you. Years of experience by the founder is available to any indie author looking for help. IndieBeacon.com, a place for creative souls to find help in marketing their creations. Have you ever thought what you would do if you had to put your life on hold to parent your parents? Charlotte Cannon has lived the journey caring for three parents with dementia, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. Her book, You Have to Laugh to Keep from Crying, How to Parent Your Parents, 
is a survival guide for adult children caring for aging seniors. Her book is available at books.txauthors.com, Amazon, or your favorite bookstore. For fans of paranormal romance comes this riveting young adult novel, Scythe of Darkness, written by Dawn Hested, is both bold and irresistible. Thrust into a sinister world with a deadly desire, this grim reaper romance is a book you won't be able to put down. Available at your favorite bookstore or at books.txauthors.com. The Middle East continues to be a political hotbed. Author James E. Doucette's new novel, The Last Assassination, takes you into a web of intrigue and deceit. The findings shock the Washington establishment and will jolt the reader. Available at your favorite bookstore or at books.txauthors.com. Welcome to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. You can send questions for each show on Twitter using the hashtag IndieBeacon. Now sit back and enjoy learning about our guest for this show. This is Charlotte Canyon, again, the author of You Have to Laugh to Keep from Crying, How to Parent Your Parents. And we are speaking with Drenda Williams. Drenda is the author of the will to live, finding the strength to survive, finding the strength within to survive. Drenda, let me let me back up a little bit here. Can you tell us a little bit about your family? Um, yeah. So, um, and I just kind of talk about that in the book. Um, so, I have a mother and father who live together. I actually, um, my biological father lived about 15 minutes away from us. So the only um, father I do know is my stepfather. Um, from he, he was with my mother since I was one years of age. So I do have um, an older sister. She's two years older than me and a younger brother um, who is six years younger than me. So um, our family size were, were five. Uh, my mother worked in a factory um, for most of her life. Um, they actually manufactured um, windows. Um, and my father really kind of had, my stepfather um, had odd and end jobs. So um, that kind of gives you the economic standpoint because it wasn't a typical two income um, household. And my mother brought in the majority of the income, which kind of led to um, why we were in a particular um, economic situation, why not having, you know, certain resources. Some available um, for the family, which again let, impacted me. I felt as a child growing up, um, going without. Now, are you said something about you were writing another book, or he had written another book? Oh what, no, uh, this is my only book. This is my. This only is book your only book. Written. Okay, I just yeah, thought I heard the only one. Earlier. Now, are you going to write another book? Um. Yes, if I did, it would be totally separate. It would deal with um, relationships. But, but at but this time, no, I'm not. I'm not um, working on you're anything. You're not ready. You're right. Now, are you are you speaking? And if so, uh, you know, where are you speaking, and uh, where can people, uh, you know, hear you and hear your story? Oh yeah. So um, I have my calendar set. Um, of course, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, so October is wow. going to be very um, busy. Um, I'm actually going to uh, be the guest speaker at the Fort Hood Military Base in Colleen, Texas, here in Central Texas for their Domestic Violence Awareness Proclamation, uh, which will be Good held the you. first week of October. So I'm definitely um, excited about that. Um, I also do participate in various book festivals. There's going to be a book festival in Houston, um, Texas, which is um, in October. Um, I think it's October 26th and 7th that I will uh, participate in that as well. And then I'm going to go back to my hometown in October. Um, I graduated from Lincoln University in Missouri and do a book dedication to the M.N. Page Library um, there as well. So um, I'm open, you know, to any other um, events or festivals or even just small organizations um, to come and speak Um, I've been fortunate to um, talk to some domestic violence awareness advocates who are in training just to give my personal story and, you know, answer any questions um, that they might have. Um, I'm trying to think. In addition, I'm open for book uh, club reading selections. I've been a part of um, two virtual book clubs um, and that have members across the country um, just to kind of discuss my book and and after they read it and do a wrap-up session as well. 
Oh, that sounds good. How long has your book been out? Um, I, it was published December of 2017. And 17. So with that being said, what has been people's reaction to your book? There's various reactions. Um, I'd start with the, the individuals that have read the book that have been in domestic violence situations. Some of them, um, after reading it, say they need to go to counseling because they're at that point where they haven't healed. They still have that baggage that's not allowing them to progress past their situation. But then we have other ones. Um, there's a lady um, that I keep in contact um, just to provide her support. Um, and she says she's read it like 40 times. She says every time she gets in a moment that's weak, that makes her maybe not feel as strong as she needs to be, she goes back and and reads those things so that she can make it through and remember, you know, she's stronger than what she actually, you know, might think at that point. Um, a lot of my um, friends have read it and my family, and their reaction is, a lot of emotional things, um, reading those traumatic things that happened to me. So a lot of times they're sad, you know, they're angry, you know, but then as they go throughout the book, they realize that I've healed from that and they see how, you know, successful I am as a person and, and um, how I conduct myself with a lot of positivity. And so I don't have that baggage where I'm stuck, you know, um, from the particular situations. Um, that I've and been I, in in the past. Yeah, and I guess every situation is different, but I'm, are there some people that just have to have um, have help or a therapist for the rest of their lives? Um, I I would say I'm trying to think that the individuals that um, did read the book, I don't think they ever went to counseling, um, but I did talk to um, a lady that lives in Georgia, and, and she was saying that, you know, she had to continuously go so that she could understand herself um, because a lot of people don't realize when you do go through a domestic violence situation, you do have those PTSD moments where there, it might be a sound or how somebody, you know, interacts with you um, that you don't realize those are the triggers to maybe those thoughts about what happened in the past. So I think continuous um, counseling is a good thing. It's very beneficial um, until you're to that point where you have healed and moved on past that. But some people may never get may never get to that point. And I guess everyone has to judge their own as they go through it. But don't yes. you think that um, everyone needs mm-hmm. needs support? Uh, let me ask you this. Do you mm-hmm. think that your book, I know my book was uh, – you have to laugh to keep from crying. How to parent my parents? I had three parents going through the aging diseases of dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's mm-hmm. all at the same time. The mm-hmm. book was actually therapy for me, but now it's blessing a lot of people. Was it therapy for you to write all these stories down? Yeah, um, because like I said, I, I was aggressively writing it um, from like 2016 to 17, so I had to go back you know, take myself, even though I'm healed from it, I had to go back in order to tell a story. So going back to those dark places to describe them, what I learned about myself is how forgiving I am as a person because all that stuff happened and I, and I harbor no ill will to my past abuser um, or, you know, maybe people that may have watched some of those instances. Um, And so that's what I learned about myself. I'm just a a very forgiving person. Um, And and I also was able to um, be proud of my growth spiritually because back then I was weak. And so now I'm, I'm strong. You know, I I work toward my purpose every day um, that I feel like why I'm here on this earth. And, And I just saw, relived the transformation um, through writing the book. Yeah. Hey, now you you have how many girls? Um, I have three daughters. Three daughters. Do you do you worry about them knowing what you went through? Um, now, my oldest daughter it, is a daughter from my relationship with my abuser. Um, and so she has some parts in the book as far as what her memories are, any words of wisdom she has being a child, seeing that situation. Um, 
And so one thing she's learned just being in a situation is, you know, what a toxic situation looks like and what she doesn't want from um, a partner in a relationship. So I think that um, is a blessing that she came out of that situation knowing, you know, what what's right and what's wrong. Now, my other two daughters, uh, we talk about um, not my my youngest one's eleven, so I don't necessarily talk to her about it. But my seventeen year, we talk about it uh, domestic violence quite a bit because um, her um, some of her classmates are going through domestic violence situations, and, and so we have uh, avid conversations about um, what what's right, what's wrong, what should she do to help support those um, individuals that are going through it. Hmm. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's a conversation that we definitely um, have in our household. On a regular basis, I'm sure. And I'm yeah, sure you probably you see it so prevalent. Yeah, and you probably keep an eye on who they're dating Oh, oh yes, most definitely. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Where can people contact you or how can they get your book? Well, definitely um, Texas Authors. Um, you can get my book um, through, That's through it, um, the web. TXAuthors.com? Mm-hmm. Yes, through there. And I also have an electronic version as well. Um, through Texas Authors, and then I also have a website, which is drendawilliams.com, which is my first and last name, .com, and so you can get it on there, or as I travel around the country um, at book festivals, um, individuals can get it um, at my booth. Oh, so you you have book signing booths, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Where's your next one? Where's your next booth? My next one is going to be um, in Dallas. Um, There is a women's um retreat that's going to be i'm trying to think of the date september the 14th through the 16th weekend and so i'm going to be there um again well drinda i hate to interrupt you but we need to wrap this up and it has been a pleasure to speak with you and thank you for being on the show and i would like to everyone remember a rose is like a book you can't know its beauty until you look at it And a book is like a rose. You won't know its full beauty until you open it. This is Charlotte. Have a nice day. Bourgeois Media and Consulting, a book publishing consultant where creative inspiration is realized. More at bourgeoismedia.com. Award-winning children's author Maria Ashworth has written books that deal with today's issues for children like bullying, friendship, blended families, love, and acceptance. Her recent release, Sushi Kitty, and other works can be found at mariaashworth.com or books.txauthors.com. Connect with her on Facebook and Twitter for speaking events and presentations. Thank you for listening to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. To learn more about Indie Beacon services, to be a guest on the show, or to advertise on our show, please visit our website at indiebeacon.com.